and I'm going to turn it over to our moderated moderator for today, Corey Salem, the Director of Sales at Unique Venues. Take it away, Corey. Thanks, Jewel, and uh, happy December 1st, everyone. Uh, I see in the chat there's a lot of folks talking about their snowy, cold areas today. We were lamenting on the call before we, we welcomed you all to the session today that the only thing that feels like this time of the year for us is when the sun sets at like 450 instead of, you know, the later times of the day. So no snow, I don't think from anyone on the call today, but we're really happy that you're able to join us. Um, we believe that this is our very first topic specifically on the summer intern housing topic. So really eager to dive into some specific content today. And I'm joined by three great panelists. Um, we've got Tony McGuirt from Furman University. Kit Morse from Seattle University and Todd Wonders from Unique Venues. And Jewel just put up a survey and we don't typically do a survey this early in the call, but it's actually really important that if you could participate in this one, it would actually help us um, significantly understand how to kind of go about the conversation today. Whether you're someone, you're joining us from a, an institution that has a well-established program, a growing program, or one that wants to um, create a summer or intern housing program and we can kind of tailor the conversation to that. So we're going to leave that poll up for a couple of minutes and while you're taking the time to respond to that, we figured we'd go around the horn and introduce ourselves and share a little bit more about who we are, um, the role at our company or our institution. And let's start today with Tony. So Tony, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, talk a little bit about your role at Furman if you don't mind. You're on mute, Tony. <laughs> I always do that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I'm, thanks, Corey. I'm, thanks for having me. Um, I am Tony McGuirt. I'm the Director of Auxiliary Services here at Furman University. Um, the conference operation, as well as several other um, revenue generating um, departments, um, report through Auxiliary Services. So um, one, of, one of our key revenue generators, other than dining and the bookstore, are um, our summer camps and conferences and year round programs. So, and our intern program falls under that. So um, that's what I do here. Furman have been here um, just a little over six years. So and prior to that was at another university um, uh, for about 14 years. So um, number of years in the college and university um, arena. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. We're, we're happy to have you. Kit, do you mind uh, sharing a little bit about who you are and your role at Seattle University? Certainly, I'm Kit Morse. I'm the Director of Conference and Event Services at Seattle University. We have um, responsibility for scheduling and supporting logistically all the events that happen on campus. Uh, and we're a small university, but somehow do between 5,000 and 6,000 events each year when there isn't COVID that require our support and setup and coordination. And then we have summer conferences and events as well um, and have started doing summer interns as part of the conference program. We take over three of the residence halls and some of the apartments in the summers and have groups in and do the coordination from that end. And I've been at Seattle U exactly 14 years and six months today. Whoa, awesome. Thanks for sharing, Kit, and welcome. We're excited to have you here. Todd Wonders from Unique Venues. Uh, you're, you're joining us today for more of a, the lens of coming and working from Unique Venues in the industry and being a part of Unique Venues adaptation toward the intern housing market and helping our venues better understand it, help them grow this business. Do you mind sharing a little bit about, uh, you know, your role currently at Unique Venues and Intern Housing Hub? Sure, Corey, thanks. And hello, hello everyone. I'm uh, Todd, Director of Technology at Unique Venues, and I've been with Unique Venues for about nine and a half years. And I've had the pleasure of working with uh, all the panelists for a number of years, uh, some at the same organization and some in a business to business capacity. And uh, in addition to doing uh, technology work for unique venues on the event side, um, I'm lead developer for internhousinghub.com, um, which is a unique venues product and had its launch actually in December of 2019 and had its founding back in 2015 through a series of pilot projects uh, that involved different marketing services for intern housing for both the interns and the the properties. So uh, looking forward today to today's discussion. Wonderful. 
Thanks, Todd. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Corey Salem. I'm the Director of Sales at Unique Venues. And even though I'll be moderating the, moderating the conversation today, this is actually an area that I'm really interested in. Um, we're starting to do a little bit more content and um, I guess subject matter expert and, and sharing kind of our industry knowledge with the clients that we're working with and the industry around Intern Housing Hub. And I actually wrote a blog post a couple of months ago that basically I see intern housing as a really good opportunity, not just as you know the summer following the COVID outbreak and a lack of business, but I think this is actually a really strong program and revenue gener generating opportunity moving forward. So I'm actually excited to, to lead the conversation and learn myself a little bit along the way and um, start to kind of fill in the gaps of my knowledge at least about what this kind of operation looks like um, on a campus level. And I appreciate everyone who participated in the survey. Jewel just made the survey results uh, public. So I think we can all take a look at this. And so what I'm seeing is most of the folks on the call today, or at least the ones who participated, um, their venues intern housing program is minimal to non-existent. And it looks like folks are looking at intern housing and summer housing as an additional revenue stream alongside of conference and event services with maybe a handful looking at a true replacement of a lack of conference and events business. Um, but I think one area or one question that I think is really going to guide our conversation today is question number three, where folks are looking for tips for building a successful program and the marketing and sales strategy to attract interns to their campus to consider their short and long-term stays for relocation. So with that in mind, let's dive right into the conversation today. And let's just start with our first question. And this is really geared toward Tony and Kit. And I'm just interested in knowing what your venue's relationship is with intern housing as a revenue generating service. As you can see, a lot of the folks on the call today have minimal to non-existent experience. What's your experience with the uh, intern housing business model and operation for your uh, institution? Kit, let's start with you if that's all right. Um, we decided to uh, open a, an intern program for the summer a couple of years ago after Unique Venues actually had advertised that they could support this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of thing where I had read that a lot of other institutions were doing it, but I didn't know if we had the tools to make it work. So when Unique Venues offered a package to help us move that along, we signed up and we're very grateful for that support. And we set a very modest goal. We had one floor in a building that we knew would be available all summer long. Um, we're on quarters, so we don't operate until June. So we were kind of thinking a lot of the, actually most of the institutions in the United States tend to be on semesters and people were gonna want housing a lot earlier. So we set a very modest goal of something like if we got eight students to sign up for the summer that we would consider it successful we'd more than make our money back um, and we, we would learn what we needed to learn well we filled the floor to overflowing that summer and even to the point where i had to contact the residence life folks and see if i could house a couple of people over in the summer uh, housing there so we um we found it to be very successful. The people really enjoyed the program. And uh, we have decided to continue that relationship with Unique Venues and sign up for the Intern Housing Hub because it's a great package that provides us with all the support we need very easily. Um, we only had one person fully dedicated to the program. And um, because of COVID, we have had fewer programs definitely booking for next summer. So we know this is a way we can make back some of that revenue, but also it's a way of introducing a lot of the students to our master's degree and PhD programs. So we did some targeted um, advertising to those folks, uh, found out what their majors were, and then contacted the schools and colleges and had them provide materials to each one. So it was a great outreach program for a bunch of them as well. And we had a couple of the students sign up for classes on top of doing their internships. So it was just a, a wonderful way of getting the name of the university out there and getting some revenue for us at the same time. So that's really neat. So almost like how campuses might rely on summer camps, youth camps as a recruitment opportunity, you were able to do the same thing with your intern housing and attracted them for academic credits or future engagement as uh, graduate students. 
exactly. That's really neat. And and Kit, if you don't mind, um, so you said that you kind of open your operation in June. How long is your summer housing period open? And do you have any restrictions on length of stay? Um, we are generally open from about the third week of June through around Labor Day. Um, so there aren't any restrictions on the, the length of stay. We, we have a one week minimum that we required of the interns, but um, we had some folks check in the, the moment we let them and they, there was one who stayed actually even past Labor Day. We got some special permissions to take care of that. So um, yeah, there weren't any particular restrictions. The one thing we've been researching is uh, everybody really wants their own bathroom and we don't have a lot of availability in those spaces on our campus. And both of the, the buildings that we have that have private bathrooms were also funded with those special bonds that make it very difficult to sell to outside. So we're researching to see whether or not uh, if we're having a student come from another institution on an internship, does that make it possibility for them to be in those uh, bond facilities? So. We're kind of hoping that works out because we had a lot of interest for apartments with not a lot of uh, apartments to offer. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. Um, and Tony, how about you uh, at Furman? I remember, you know, when we were talking earlier, you said that this is kind of a newer program for you, similar to Kit, you know, kind of a modest growth strategy and goal setting. So do you mind sharing a little bit about that for the audience as well? Sure. Um, I guess when I arrived here at Furman about six years ago, we were, the, the, pro, the summer program was in sort of a growth phase. Um, we had some space, we had some housing, and um, within about two years of being here, we had um, the program continue to grow, and we'd reached a point where we had some limitations on being able to sell some additional housing because we were, we only had a certain amount of meeting space available. So we were looking for ideas on how can we still sell these beds and not, you know, have to have a large amount of meeting space to meet the needs of a group or another conference. So intern housing was where we started with that um, because we, we realized we had some beds that we could consistently sell throughout the summer. Um, that if the interns wouldn't require anything on campus, um, it was kind of a perfect match. So our approach was just to kind of build our own homegrown website and just put it out there, attach it to ours to see what happened. Um, we began reaching out through our chamber and local, you know, organizations here in the area just to let them know we had this option. And I, you know, our first year we had a handful of folks that um, that um, took us up on our services, and we hosted I think about six our first summer and. You know, for us, starting small was great. We worked through a lot of kinks and wrinkles in the process on how to handle it and um, made some adjustments for year two. And we would have, I guess, been, this past summer would have been year four for us. Um, and we've consistently um, seen growth every summer since then because we, you know, number one, like I said, we sort of took some good notes. We made some adjustments in year two and had tremendous response the second year. Um, it grew even further in the third year. And then last year, we, um, last summer would have been our first summer using the, the unique venues intern hub as well. Um, we actually, if we had been able to host, we probably would have seen our business um, more than double um, based on the revenue target we had for last summer. So it's been one of these, we've been slowly growing, but um, leaps and bounds. And it's been really good revenue with, you know, not a lot of effort once they check in. I mean, they check in, they check out, you provide a few services for them throughout the um, time that they're here. Uh, it, we use one staff member that's really dedicated to the program to manage it with the rest of us jumping in and filling in when, you know, we need to, as well as our student staff. So it's been a um, profitable venture from a standpoint of Little, very little expense, um, a high profit margin compared to the staff time and effort that we put into this program. That's great. I appreciate that, Tony. And we already have a ton of questions, which is amazing. I think a lot of what you've shared is striking a chord with the folks. Um, before we get into the questions, though, I did just want to ask Todd, because I know that Todd, um, you know, had been with Unique Venues uh, back in 2015, whenever we first started as I mentioned earlier, addressing this area and revenue opportunity. 
um, for the campuses and other venues that we work with. And it kind of started from a consultative based approach to one off solutions to what we have as intern housing hub today. Um, and Todd, I just wanted to ask, you know, in, in that time between 2015 and now, have you seen the demand or maybe even the, the level of engagement with venues that offer intern housing changed in that time? Are you seeing it as something that people think is maybe more lucrative? Are you noticing any trends kind of from your lens um, from the staff side? From the staff side? Um, certainly in, intern housing is being viewed as more lucrative. Yeah. Um, and I think what is helping that, particularly, particularly for those institutions that can provide year round as well as summer is that uh, the number of, in, number of interns we see searching out on search engines has uh, increased substantially over the past several years, particularly between January and March, but year round as well. There are no longer many uh, low points throughout the year when students are looking for housing while they're serving their internship. So, you know, that's, that's one positive factor that's contributing to the excitability out there in terms of uh, marketing these services. Yeah. That's, and I know that for us too, we kind of see the search period really pick up in the middle of January and then depending, you know, on the intern and when they choose to do their research for their relocation efforts, it could go as late as, you know, the first or second week of May. Um, but that's an interesting note, Todd, that it's something that has been, you know, increasing in terms of the volume. Um, here's my first question. Uh, and this comes from uh, Daniel Himes in Buffalo, New York. And I, it is, I think is directed uh, mostly to Kit. Daniel asks or says, I'm interested in hearing more about the restrictions due to bonds attached to the buildings. Would you be able to expand on this point? Sure, we have some, um, some of the buildings that we have on campus have been built with the special bonds that require that only 501c3 organizations or government operations use those facilities and if you don't if you violate that um, i think you get a three percent per year use um, margin of error and if you violate that it means that anyone who purchased the bonds are, are going to have to pay taxes on them retroactive mm -hmm. so it's one of those things that the lawyers are pretty much like don't ever violate this or we'll kill you and string you up and maybe not in that order <laughs> so um, we're very, very particular about that sort of thing, um, what we can have in them. Um, the sad thing is that most of the adult groups really want their own bathrooms, but most of those are like 501c6 or something very slightly off, so we can't offer them the apartments that we would want to do. But we are, we're actually pretty hopeful that they're going to come up with a ruling that it is okay for us to use these for the interns as long as the student comes from a nonprofit uh, 501c3 organization. So we're thinking it should be okay. Mm. And not being in the weeds of, of this lingo and legality and those kinds of things, I, I don't know if this addressed the question, but this is another question for you, Kit, from Chris Bowen in uh, Wayne State in Detroit. Chris says, we require a minimum 30 night stay to avoid charging taxes. Do you charge students tax taxes if they only stay for a week? No, um, Washington State has some really horrible rules about taxation, but for the most part, um, it's not an issue when it comes to the length of stay. Uh, our lawyers are the most conservative folks I know. It's one of the reasons we're not pushing more youth groups. They're just really about uh, anything that might be potentially liable on any area whatsoever. So this one is one where the, the length of stay has not been an issue for us. Great, thanks. Um, and I, I'll just ask Tony that as well. Is that, you know, length of stay an issue in terms of when it comes to taxing or, or breaking or following any rules? No, our legal um, sees the interns because they're coming from an educational institution that us hosting them while they're here getting academic credit, that it falls within our academic mission. So um, it preclude, you know, removes us from that liability of the tax issue. Um, and our folks are pretty conservative too. So, um, and, and in order to make sure that maintain it, we do require documentation from the school and from the student 
that this is, you know, as part of their educational program um, and from the actual hiring company that they are providing them with that, this internship so that we have documentation that, you know, for every question um, we can show that it does follow the university's mission. Great. And then I saw Kevin Sheehan um, shared in the chat, Kevin said, we require that all interns are college students, thus they fit our mission and the derived income is not considered unrelated, unrelated business income. So that sounds like a common theme, but it also sounds like a common theme just to, to have the right friends on the legal team and, and run things by them as well. I don't think that that ever necessarily hurts. Um, David Ward, I see your question. I want to let you know that uh, there's a specific pool question kind of tied to this later on that I think we'll address a little bit more specifically then, but I'll bring that up then. So I just want to let you know that I'm not overlooking that. Um, an anonymous attendee has said, currently we are, the we are only able to market to a, ver uh, to a very few local companies with summer interns, not able to market to individuals. How do you even start promoting to individuals? And maybe that's a good place to kind of kick off this next round of questioning is maybe Tony and Kit, I, I know that you both use Intern Housing Hub, Tony, it sounds like this is kind of a newer adoption built on um, a program that was already established. Kit, it sounds like you built your program to coincide with the Intern Housing Hub solution. And I know Todd works in building the advertising campaign that we do. So maybe let's start in that reverse order. And maybe I'll start with Todd and just say, Todd, we know that a lot of folks are searching individually for their own um, short and long-term accommodations. We know that they're using a lot of search engines as with everything else in life. So what are some strategies that folks can do? And what have you seen kind of be successful from the intern housing hub side that has helped attract, attract folks to our site, as well as kind of bring in applications for the venues that we're working with too? Digital advertising right now is definitely number, number one. There's no question about it. Um, and almost a, just a natural, uh, not, not even a coincidence, I'm not sure the word I'm looking for here, but I'll just say universities, colleges, universities are well positioned in search results. I'm not sure if anonymous attendee is, is with a university, um, but they are well positioned in search results to practically have the intern housing market cornered in some way, shape or form. Um, so that helps. I, I do see institutions setting up specific social media presences for just interns and accommodations housing separate from conference and events. So if they already have a conference and events page on Facebook as one example, there are many of course, they are setting up that separate intern housing presence on social media, um, as well as having their own presence on site and of course on their own website and of course a, a profiled internhousinghub.com can help as well. But you know, in, individuals a lot of, of the bookings you're looking to achieve there will be capitalized um, through search engines. There's no question about it. And let's, I have another question, but I actually want to pass it over to Tony and kind of ask that same question in that regard. You know, as you were building this program and establishing it, it sounded like you were reaching out to companies uh, nearby, just to let them know of your um, availability and maybe hoping to have them funnel some interns to you. Did you do anything specifically to attract the individual intern outside of their internship placement? Really, we, as I said earlier, we built a, a web page or web presence on our website, attached it to our summer programs um, website, but it was, it was a page dedicated to intern housing. And I'll be honest with you, our first summer I think all six of our interns were individuals who found us through mm -hmm. just doing a search on this on the website looking for um, internship housing um, during the summer and we popped up just with that one page and I'll be honest with you you know because we were really new at this and it was our first year I don't know that we did a lot of um, you know I don't know if we had a, I, don't, I don't even think we I don't even know if we had a lot of the great keywords but it worked for us and as we've learned from it, it's continued to, you know, it's continued to be profitable for us, but we the website is what's really brought us more and more of the um, individual um, folks. And then now we have that, that page basically is now the, is the Unique Venues Intern Hub website that we are linked to now. So um, we're seeing even more of that individual traffic because of the, um, 
because of the web page there, we're getting uh, uh, even more traffic individually. Our um, some of our some of our local companies that we've actually had some um, relationships with have come through reaching out to you know just our, our chamber and organizations like that where you know industry is a member of. So, um, but the individual stuff has come mainly from the website. Awesome. And Kit, in that regard, anything to add? alongside of what uh, you know Todd or Tony have mentioned about attracting individuals is there anything that you've done at Seattle University outside of the intern housing hub world um, that has worked towards attracting some folks who aren't being you know recommended your venue based on their placement or um, your institution uh, yes and actually the conservative council that I mentioned earlier doesn't want us to go to to companies and ask them to send Oh. groups of people. Um, some of our sister universities have had issues with a company sending a whole bunch of people who spend all their time together during the day and then party all night. Whereas if you get a whole bunch of individuals who don't know each other, uh, we didn't have any problems at all with that sort of situation. So that's our, our target is actually individuals. And we're very lucky in that we're in a, you know, an internationally recognized city with technology and a lot of different industries. But um, in addition to the Intern Housing Hub and our website, we also monitor social media quite a lot. There are folks out there who are looking for intern housing through Facebook pages and, and other um, areas. So we've looked that way as well. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And, you know, I guess along those lines, especially knowing that folks are looking for, you know, tips um, for a strong program, as well as marketing and sales insights, I think that this is an appropriate next question. And this is going to sound hyperbolic. And when I say, what do people need to do today? That doesn't mean immediately today. But I guess my question is, what do people need to do right now, maybe with today or in a week to establish themselves as a really attractive venue for hosting interns in the summer? Like at this point in the life cycle where both Tony and Kit are hosting summer interns, what are you doing in the dead of winter to help um, get, you know, build a successful program for the following summer? What are some, what are some things that people should be doing today to, to step off on the right foot? And Todd, if you have anything to share, feel free to, to jump in on this one too. Um, Corey, for us, I mean, one of the things that we do is, again, we, on an annual basis, we start reaching out to like the local chamber, um, organizations where industries are members of to let them know that we're here. Um, and we really kind of do a sales pitch, you know, here's why, you know, Furman is a great option for your interns that you're bringing in from other institutions. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're just right outside of the city limits. Um, you, in 15 minutes, you can be downtown. We're actually attached to um, what's called the um, Swamp Rabbit Trail, which folks can actually leave the campus on a bike and drive all the way into downtown safely. Um, there's, there's a lot of hiking and, th hiking and outdoor adventure stuff around us as well. So we just sort of put together a package of what makes us perfect for, um, for an intern coming from, you know, someplace and they know nothing about where we, who we are, what we are. Um, so we try to do a sales pitch that, you know, um, here's the services we offer on campus. Here's what the city around us offer here, you know, extracurricular activities um, to try to sell and, you know, help this um, individual make that decision to come stay with us. And, you know, I think where we're situated helps us as well. So those are the kind of things we start doing early to get the word out, um, as well as, you know, just refreshing our, um, our website, our webpage, our, all of our information that's out there. And that's something we're in the process of doing right now. So keeping it current, keeping things updated and establishing relationships. Awesome. Kit, anything that you're doing this time of the year to really kind of set Seattle University up for success in the summer? One of the things I'm trying to do is a master game of Tetris to try to free up more space sure. so that we can offer more housing. Because um, now that we've, last time we did this, we didn't start advertising till March and we still filled up. So if we do this in a more timely manner this year, I think we could do a lot better as far as booking. So um, we created some 
marketing materials and, and that sort of thing a little hastily last time. And, you know, as, as Tony was mentioning, we also have a lot of great uh, features of the local city that the university can offer, you know, such as our library use, uh, we have free internet, mm. um, a lot of great natural wonders and downtown and the Space Needle is less than two miles from our uh, the door of the, the residence hall. So there's a lot of great things that we can do to advertise uh, better than hastily pasted together things. So we're trying to do a little better on our marketing and, and let people know all the features they can have by uh, coming and staying with us. Thanks for sharing that. That's really cool. Todd, anything to add around kind of, you know, this time in, in the marketing and sales cycle, is there things that should be happening now, or is this kind of really a planning period for that early January, whenever you want to start attracting, you know, the beginning of the peak search season? I think if you have a well-established program or are ready to go and launch a program, the, the digital side and, and the marketing side using digital tools um, can be brought to, to bear rather quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, speaking from the perspective of the tool we provide, I've seen some institutions launch their presence using our tool in less than two hours. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest that, you know, part of your planning or even ramping up your program include a lot of high quality photos um, of the, the, the location, of the amenities around campus, considering we're speaking to mostly campuses here. Um, I've seen some institutions load as many as 50 photos. So, you know, or some just use one, but, I, I do know based upon the analysis we see that photos are, are selling the presence out here and um, small bits of information. Really, you know, as I said, you know, at least this tool, you can say a lot of things with a couple clicks and a couple sentences and really present yourself well um, in a short period of time, um, even while you are still planning. But uh, Kit did mention that, you know, she, she launched uh, Seattle University in March, so, so to speak, and saw results. But you know, if, if you do launch in January, you know, at least this tool can help you do that. Awesome. All right, can I throw in one more? Just as I was thinking as Todd was talking, one of the things that we've done, especially when, um, some of the companies we've been working with, we sort of tried to do a local analysis of you know, what it would cost to rent an apartment, sublet an apartment in Greenville, um, looking at various areas of the, the city, um, when you start adding in utilities and cable and all these other things that you would have to pay for, which kind of, kind of a bulk cost benefit analysis of our prices versus, not that we're trying to, we are competing, but to try to show that, you know, we are a good, we're a good buy for what you get. Because sometimes I don't think folks realize that, you know, I may sign this lease for three months, but I've also still got to pay utilities. I've got to pay all these other options that, um, the price that, you know, I'm quoting you includes the majority of those things. So we, we've done that kind of cost benefit analysis of why this is a better buy um, for you as a college student. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think too, what well-established venues have to offer that maybe people subletting or, you know, posting it to Craigslist don't is that you're a well-established institution. Uh, you're safe. You've got like you said, Tony, those amenities in house that I know some of our venues that we work with, they do have kind of a package that people can buy on top of the room, but in other cases, all that's included. And not to mention, and this is, I think, a point that Kit, you know, brought up earlier too, is that you're attracting a lot of other college age students. So they're coming from one living situation that they're familiar with to another living situation that they're familiar with, that I really think that you can tap into that as well. Um, and this is a question from the audience um, that I really like, and it can, kind of goes down to location, location, location. We all know how important that is. And just a side note, um, Todd is located out of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where kind of the unique venues headquarters is, and that's where I'm from. And we were kind of joking earlier that it's certainly not Greenville, South Carolina or Seattle to attract interns. But as we started talking, we did realize that there are plenty of companies in Johnstown that do attract interns. And I don't think, I, I think interns are really going to a lot of locations, not just the major cities that we might see more traditionally with, you know, major events or something like that. Like this is an area where I think that there's a lot of demand in every single nook and cranny in the US and Canada. 
So that being said, Samantha asks, we've also had some of our current students inquire about staying throughout the summer as their internship is closer to the school than their home. Since they're current students, do you charge them the same rate as a non-student? Do they receive a discount? How do you handle maybe Seattle University students who are staying for that summer for a Seattle-based internship or maybe a Greenville you know, student staying or, or not non-resident of Greenville staying and wanting to stay at Furman for a Greenville-based internship. Do you have any advice on that? I think it would depend on the length of the stay. If they were planning to stay all summer, they would probably go and stay with the Housing and Residence Life has a summer program where um, the students are off in a different location they, than they would be in the academic year. And so they would go stay with them. If it were for a shorter period of time, and we did have that happen a couple times, um, they could come stay with us and they would just pay the intern rates, which are pretty reasonable anyway. We're, we're similar to that. Um, if a student, if it's a Furman student and they're actually doing an internship locally, um, they may not live here, but they're doing it locally and they're getting academic credit for it. Since they're considered a matriculating student, they actually qualify for summer school housing. I, you know, I'm going to be honest, because we do it on a weekly and a nightly basis, depending on our race, depending on what they're contracting for, our rates could be a little cheaper depending on the length of stay. Um, because summer school housing is you you pay for certain blocks of time, um, but it, but the student does qualify to stay in summer school housing, and typically that's where most of our local students or Furman students will stay. Um, we benefit mainly from the folks who are non-Furman students who are coming from other areas. Um, occasionally, we'll have some that you know they're they're doing this as intern as something for a resume builder, and because they're a Furman have been a Furman student. Um, we will allow them to stay and we'll, we'll charge them the intern rate. And Tony, I think you struck a chord whenever you were mentioning the relationships that you're establishing with local businesses. One of the questions we asked in that second pool was to the folks uh, sitting in the call who have a program, you know, where are you attracting your interns? Like what sector are you seeing your interns coming from? Um, but while we were doing kind of our prep call, you mentioned a business relationship that you've established with a local manufacturing company. Um, and that's kind of part of David Ward's question where he asks, would love to hear strategies on building relationships with corporate clients to build a pipeline for intern, intern housing. So do you, do you have any advice to share in that? I know that you've kind of explained that a lot in, in reaching out and at least just showing yourselves and doing that cost benefit analysis, but especially with this kind of, um, I guess, it, uh, I'm, I'm trying exclusive relationship you have with this manufacturing company. Was there anything special that went into that relationship building process? Well, I, the, the interesting thing is this is a result of um, us sending out some information to these, the, these, um, all these industries that are a member of the chamber and other organizations that we're members of and have, you know, the ability to use the, um, the mailing list. Um, this is actually one of the um, one of the companies um, got that mailer, went to our website, which is now you know the unique venues hub, and then they actually contacted us mm. um, about doing an exclusive contract for this coming summer. Um, the company typically hosts anywhere from fifteen to eighteen interns per summer, you know, from all over the U.S. Um, maybe even Canada. I, I don't. I didn't. Really, I didn't ask specifically where they are coming from, but. Um, but one of the things they wanted to try to offer to entice students um, to take their internship was to already have a housing package available for them. And I think we're going to even, I, I, I don't know how they were going to go their end, but they were going to kind of offer maybe an incentive with their package that, you know, here's what you get and here's what, um, here's where you're going to be staying. And so we've um, negotiated um, a, a, a contract for all 15 to 18, depending on what the final number is for them for the summer. Knock on wood, as long as COVID lets us host the summer. We're, um, but that's, and that one just kind of, it, it, it's just a, um, it came about through our marketing efforts and then, you know, using the um, marketing tool of the intern hub as well, kind of a combination that they reached out to us and we just sort of took it and ran with it and sold them on it. So, and we, you know, are at this point looking to develop a couple other relationships with other folks who we've had interns from in the past 
a um, couple of summers too. So um, it, sometimes all it takes is that one internship and you get that one contact and you kind of can build on it to grow um, um, additional interns. And I've heard a lot of you talking about the relationships with, you know, the uh, um, companies, organizations that are hosting the intern. Do you ever establish relationships with other campus career centers or departments um, and, and being like a selected location for a partner campus in Florida, for instance, as an intern hosting site, or is all of your kind of relationships at the moment with the companies? Mine are with the companies, but I would love to have developed those relationships yeah. <laughs> right. with other career centers to do that. So I'm all for that. So um, yeah, it's almost like how you know cities have sister cities across the world. It's almost like a stat finding that one campus across the U.S. that you can have that relationship with. Kit, is that anything that you offer at Seattle University by any chance? Is having those relationships with other campuses? Not yet, but you can be sure I just took notes about it. Okay. Sweet. <laughs> Love that. And I'm just going to mention right now that it's already 2.43 Eastern time. We've got a ton of questions in the Q&A. So I think I'm just going to ditch some of the pre-planned questions I had and just go for those. But I will just mention to the folks in the audience, with permission from Tony and Kit, of course, is if maybe we can go five minutes over today, if that works for your schedule. And for the folks who... Um, uh, need to, to go and have a hard deadline, just know that this is being recorded and you can watch it, um, you know, once it's uploaded to YouTube. So let's go to the next question that I, I caught here from Megan Kastner that says, my venue is curious about insurance. I have seen some venue, I have seen some venues, their insurance covers interns staying the summer, but ours does not. Should interns up, uh, obtain their own insurance? Should their hiring companies or should we as in the venue? Um, and if you do it as your venue, do you have any preferred uh, insurance vendors or partners that you work with? So I know that that's a pretty loaded question, but. Um, we don't, we, we want to make sure that anybody has their own health insurance, but the liability, they're kind of under our programs, just general liability and, and not specifically. We, we don't have any uh, additional insurance that's purchased on their behalf or and we don't require them to purchase anything liability wise. Uh, but we do say that you need your own health insurance because our, our health center won't handle anybody outside of our own students. Mm. Um, we're sim similar in that, that um, we require any insurance responsibility is that it, we, the onus is put back on them. Um, the contract they signed for us, you know, says that, you know, we we're not, holding, we're not hosting the liability. We suggest that they um, provide their own um, through their, whether it's their parents' insurance um, um, as a third party. But uh, we basically, um, our contract says, you know, and we do encourage them to get renter's insurance if, you know, there's a theft or something of that nature. But again, our contract reads that, you know, you can't hold firm and liable um, for that. But we do encourage them to make sure they're insured on their end. Gotcha. Um, and Chris Bowen just mentioned, we recommend interns get their own insurance if they are reserving as an individual. If we contract with a company, the company is required to provide insurance. Because I know in, in speaking with some campuses, as they've been, you know, considering bringing on Intern Housing Hub, one of the questions they ask a lot is kind of, if they're doing this for the first time, where does the liability fall when working with an intern and, and welcoming an intern to that campus is the liability on the student is the liability on the company that the intern is coming is interning with so i know that liability is a big issue and i think it kind of goes in maybe to the next question from cynthia who asks how do you deal with behavioral and mental health issues with interns who are not your own students is there any examples that you have or, or any guidance that you can share with, you know, your past experience? I'll jump in. I'll be on, I have to say we have not had any major issues with any of our interns. We um, are very clear up front that these are our expectations. Um, we, part of our process is that the student understands that we have, we have a contact back at the university that, you know, says this is, you're here for academic reasons. Um, because you are a student, we expect, we hold you to the same standards of our students. Um, 
Same thing with the employer. You know, we have the same kind of documentation that's signed by both or they provide us. So knowing that we are connected to both ends of, you know, their spectrum, the university and the, where they work, we've had, I, I can't even think of an incident that we've had and we really haven't had any students who've had any major health issues or mental health, anything at this point. So we've been fortunate there, but as far as behavior, I mean, they're normal college students, but nothing out of the ordinary. We've actually had some really, really good luck and um, hope that that continues and hope we hope that our policies, procedures, and how we um, sort of, you know, educate the students as they come in the door, um, what our expectations are. We hope that, you know, continues to bring us that good luck. Mm. Awesome. Yep. As Tony and I keep saying, yeah, like he said, we don't, we haven't had many issues. We had, I think, one or two behavioral problems last year. Um, we have conference assistants who are staffing the front desks they went up to verify there was a noise issue and they knocked on the door and asked them to quiet down. Uh, if there's anything else, we would contact our public safety folks to assist if that became an issue. But um, it's the same thing where we have the code of conduct there in the, the before you can even sign a contract, it says you have to agree to all of our uh, rules and, and requirements and they sign that before they even get to us. So um, one thing in our step, we don't send them the link to register for housing until we've had them fill out a pre-form that has the dates that they want and what they're looking for. Because our registration form requires that they send a deposit along with it. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we can actually accommodate them before we have them booking anything. So there's a little bit of pre-screening involved and helps them understand this is what you're getting into before you go to the registration process and sign up for sure. And that was going to kind of be my next question as, you know, maybe a guiding point for the folks who are doing this for the first time. What, what do you require folks who are applying to stay at your campus as an intern in the summer? I know some folks are requiring proof of internship. Um, you know, what, what do you, what are you requiring? Uh, Tony, let's start with you at Furman. Um, we do require, require proof of internship from the company, we require proof that they're a student and that this is for, ac for academic purposes. Um, like they're getting, a, whether it's credit or, I mean, I know sometimes students don't necessarily do it for credit, but that it is sanctioned by their institution. Um, and then, um, you know, we require, we have certain, uh, you know, policies, procedures that we require them to um, sign off on and adhere to, as well as financial, um, requirements as well. You have to pay us. We set up a financial payment plan, whether it's all up front or depending on the, you know, the interns, you know, how they're getting their funding, whether it's they're paid monthly, bi-weekly, whatever, we'll work with them as far as a payment plan as well for the students. So it's sort of all mapped out in the process. And we're really like Kit as well. We, we get an initial interest form and then we vet that student to, you know, to make sure that they, you know, do fall into, you know, all of the, they check all the boxes that we require. And then from there, we, it's just, it's a, it's a step-by-step -step process to um, sign that final contract. Ours is very similar um, in the agreement. We have them state that they, by even applying for this, they are guaranteeing that they are a student enrolled at an institution of high, an accredited uh, institution of higher learning, that the internship is um, for credit, and then we want them to give us their contact information for their institution, and we say we'll verify that. Um, in practice, we don't actually verify each one. Um, we were going to, in the last summer, I think we were going to do something like randomly one out of five call the institution and verify enrollment. But um, we want them to verify and put the onus on them for providing the proof as opposed to us collecting it and, and having it in hand for every single person. Uh, that would make it a little more logistically of a nightmare than we wanted to deal with. Gotcha. I will add here, Corey, if it's okay. Um, one of the positive things we've, we've realized in um, developing this contract with this company that um, we're gonna have an exclusive relationship with is the company actually asked us because they're going to be handling a lot of the, um, they're going to be providing us with a lot of details of the students. Um, we'll do some of our training as the students check in, but 
they actually ask us to, they want to know if there's an issue because they feel like that student is representing them as an intern because they're, you know, they're actually promoting the housing. So that's actually helping us because mm -hmm. if we, we do have an issue, we're just going to go to the workplace and say, you know, you got to help us fix this kind of thing. So that's been a positive as well there uh, in that process. We weren't expecting that, but it was a nice um, little caveat there to throw in. Sure. Um, I'm going to deviate from the questions that have been submitted real quick and just ask this one because I, I, I do want to include Todd into this too, is uh, for venues on the call looking to add intern housing to their summer or even build upon it, what do you believe is the most important aspect of a proper intern housing operation or sales and marketing plan in that case? So what do you think is the most important thing that if you want someone to walk away with some knowledge today, this would be it? I think in my case, sorry, I was having a lot of barking dogs for a sec, just um, in my case, it's making sure people know what the options are and being very clear about what we can and what we cannot do. Um, we had tons of people who wanted their own bathroom and, and we just didn't have that capability. On the other hand, each of our bedrooms has a sink in it. Um, and there's a third bathroom that does invi invite some privacy uh, on each. There's a, a disabled accessible private bathroom on each floor. So people are welcome to use that as well. So when we're clear in saying we can't do this, but here's what we can do. Um, I think that really helped people a lot is that everyone seemed to think they wanted an apartment, but for a lot less money, they could get pretty much what they wanted and um, be really satisfied with what they had available to them. Great. Um, I'll chime in. I'll, I can es essentially say that uh, think about the end game and be prepared to, if you can, have a wait list and what you might do with um, students that are on that wait list. Kit alluded to it earlier in the fact that she had to go and seek more space. Uh, to accommodate more, but uh, I've seen enough evidence now throughout the years that wait lists are become a, a typical part of the operation once you're booked. Anything to add, Tony? No, I um, I guess my only I guess thoughts there would be if you're something you're starting and you haven't, you know, you're just starting like brand new, fresh. Um, I found that starting small on our end really helped us that first year to have just a handful. Um, it was easy to manage. Um, we learned from our mistakes and were able to really capitalize on that and really make it a um, much better program the following year. So, uh, but it's, as I said, it's continued to grow. We're actually have been extremely pleased with the revenue that we've generated um, and, you know, look forward to, um, continuing that revenue growth, because as I said earlier, it's um, the margin on that revenue is much higher than our other groups. So we um, want to see that continue to grow as long as we have the bed space. Great. Well, we're at 255. We're not going to get to all of the questions and I apologize about that. And I'm going to put my email address in the chat um, area so that if you want to, to send me any questions, I'm sure um, if it's okay with Tony and Kit, maybe even introducing you virtually and we can, you know, continue the conversation over email if that's okay with them and, and Todd. Um, but I think the last question that I just want to ask today um, is what hesitations or conflicts are there for summer 2021 amidst the pandemic? Um, quarantine restrictions and policies for, um, to respond to interns who con contract the virus versus um, matriculated students. So how are you handling your summer intern program with COVID-19? Um, you know, let's imagine that we don't, nothing's changing between now and the summer. A lot of the folks who said, um, who we asked the question earlier, said that they're definitely hosting or most likely hosting interns this year. So I'm sure everyone's planning for it. Um, if you've planned for it, Kit and Tony, what are some of the things that you have in place as you're, you're preparing for a COVID world and not responding to a new COVID world, I guess is what we had in 2020. 
we haven't finished uh, all of our planning for the summer yet, but um, I would anticipate that we ha will have some of the same things in place for the summer that we have in the academic year. We have one building that um, we've set aside to put people in who have to quarantine. So they've been around somebody who's been tested, but who's tested positive, but they haven't had a chance to test yet. And then we had a separate building that was um, apartments, um, what do you call them, uh, studio apartments. So they're fully self-contained that we had put folks who needed to isolate. So they had definitely tested positive for COVID. So if somebody comes down with it, we'll be able to, to respond and provide some alternate housing and get people away and let folks know. But um, we're trying to work on the contract to make sure that if there's a, a huge outbreak right before, then there are cancellations that we're handling that. Um, we want Pete to make sure that uh, we're only putting people in single rooms this summer. Last year, we had a few people who want to do doubles. And this year, I think it would be just a, a smarter idea to, to go with the singles and then see if we can offer more apartments in general, if that works out, just because I think that's a safer option um, all around. Sure. Yeah, I think we're very, we're very similar in the sense that we, you know, are we will have space dedicated for quarantine for folks who test positive or have been traced, um, you know, being in contact with someone who's tested positive, as well as, um, you know, we're just, we're also in discussion, you know, I, as much as I hate to say this right now, Greenville has a very high percentage of COVID positive, rate, the positive rate is pretty high right now. Um, if, you know, we don't see a change in this and it going, you know, down um, significantly, if we're allowed to actually have folks, um, we would probably would implement some of the same discussion, some of the same procedures we do with students. And that's, um, we would require testing every so often to make sure that, you know, anyone on campus is, um, you know, if they're positive, we can quarantine them or they, you know, go home to quarantine, however it, it works out. But some of the same requirements that we'll require of our students may be um, required of our um, summer guests and interns, depending on where we are with COVID. Um, there's a lot of discussion about that right now, so we're not really sure where we're going to be with that, but we're talking about A, B, C, D, and probably even E plans just to yeah. have all our bases covered. Smart thing to do. Contingencies for the contingencies. Um, okay, so it's three o'clock, so I'm, I am going to squeeze in one more question, and I think it might be a pretty quick answer because Marty King is asking, what percent do you um, sell individuals and what percent from companies? For example, do you get a 50, do you get 50 percent of your interns from individuals purchasing and individuals from companies offering internships to students? It sounded like from earlier, Kit only really works exclusively with individuals and not working through companies. Um, and Tony, I know that you mentioned both. Do you have any data off the top of your uh, head about? what the breakdown is with your interns percentage wise? Probably, I mean, up until this current year, most of our, most all of ours was um, individual. So I'd say, you know, 90% um, moving with the agreement we have with this current company, depending on how many individuals we end up with this year, you know, that percentage is going to be mm -hmm. a little bit lower and we're and it's going to go higher on the um, corporate side. Um, or company side. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to see it grow either way. Um, the revenue for us is basically the same. Um, so it, but right now we're, initially it's been the individuals that's really um, filled our beds thus far. Um, the, but we are, you know, looking at ways to move more into the company, you know, the, you know, the relationship with companies so that, um, you know, we have some of these, we have some beds that we know there's a guarantee we're going to fill. Um, and then the individuals just kind of like fill in the other um, vacancies that we have um, in the summer. Well, I could keep going on and on with this discussion, so I'll need to stop myself. Jewel, um, is there anything, any other questions left to add or should, is it time to wrap this one up? I, I think, well, 
honestly, I, I think one other question that might be really interesting, Holly Sine asked this question, which is, what other services do you offer to interns once they arrive? Is it basically, hey, welcome, here's your key, and have we'll see you in 60 days when you check out? Or are you involved in trying to do some programming or involve them in some other activities? What kinds of services or activities are you offering to interns mm -hmm. that are staying with you during the summer months? Kit? Um, we did a, a Facebook page for the members who were staying on campus. Um, and then I sent out some emails uh, with weekly information on the, the festivals that were going on, um, things they could get involved in on campus, any lectures, um, different services that the campus offered. We also required that they had food service, which I know is kind of unusual. And we didn't require a huge amount, but we wanted to funnel about one breakfast's worth of food per day toward um, the food service folks so they would have a steady stream of folks coming in. So um, just made sure we let them know what was going on, what the hours were, uh, and again, any activities that were immediately nearby for the, uh, for the students. Great, and Tony? Um, we, again, we, as, as Kit said, we do offer food service options packages. Um, it's not required, but we will work with the individuals, individuals based on the, you know, their, their work pattern and what meals you know are um that they're on campus and they're able to participate in if they would like that um they can they can actually pay to participate in our physical activity center for workouts and things of that nature they are charged the same fee that our summer guests are charged um you know and most of the other amenities on campus as long as it's you know open and free you know they're welcome to that such as you know we have a bookstore we have a barnes and noble we have all these other things on campus, um, all the other recreational activities on campus, they can rent a bike through the recreation center and um, bike the Swamp Rabbit Trail or wherever around here. So um, most amenities that we have, um, they, they're welcome to participate in. The, you know, not sure what's gonna happen with COVID. You know, right now there are certain buildings that are off limit to anyone who's not a student. Um, if we continue in this, you know, where we are now, that may still be, you know, may, may, may mean some amenities won't be available, but if we can offer it, we're gonna, we'll put it out there for them. That's great. All right, well, I wanna thank um, Corey for putting this together today. This was his idea and he did all the work behind it. I'd love to thank uh, Tony, Kit and Todd for being our expert panelists today. We appreciate your time and commitment. Uh, to helping to share with our audience all the different ways that you've been engaged in intern housing. And I especially want to thank all the participants that joined us today. This was one of our most engaged webinars that we've had since we've been offering them. Uh, again, it's, it's always sad when we can't get all the, to all the questions, but it's always nice to know that people are that interested in the topic that they just keep rolling forward. So it's too bad we're not all together somewhere where we could all go grab a drink and, and keep the conversation going. But next year in 2021, those are the kinds of things we're going to get back to doing again. So uh, with that being said, just really quickly, I want to remind everyone here that um, if I can find, there it is. That we do have just a few more things coming up before the year ends. I can't believe I'm saying that, but it's December and the year is going to end very soon. Um, so today's uh, intern housing panel is done. Forgot to take that off the list. Uh, Thursday, Chuck Salem will be doing marketing New Year's resolutions, uh, talking about the things that you should be thinking about, especially given everything that we face this year as we head into next year. On December 8th, Chris Moore is going to be doing another session on your word of the year, another way of thinking about resolutions for next year, uh, not necessarily specific to marketing and sales, just to making sure that you deliver and commit to the things that you resolve to do in the new year. Uh, and then a big fun event that we're planning is on Thursday, December 10th. It's our UV end of year celebration. Uh, everyone is welcome. It's gonna be a big giant Zoom meeting with everybody's faces on the screens. I have no idea how we're gonna control it all, but we'll figure it out in one way or the other. You know, we'll all have a great time because that's what we do. And then finally, the last chance of the year for members and planners. We have a member group therapy on the 15th and a planner round table on the 17th. And so with that, uh, again, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Thank you to our panelists and to Corey. Everyone have a safe holiday season coming up if we don't see you, but we hope to see each and every one of you at an upcoming webinar and especially at our end of year, uh, end of year celebration. So thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day.